So in our lecture series, Math 4230, uh, we've been focusing recently on the topic of fields, particularly field extensions. Uh, we want to utilize the tools we've developed for field extensions to focus on the idea of finite fields. So let's say a few things about that. So first of all, recall that if a ring has a characteristic n, remember n, the characteristic of a ring is how many times does it take for the one element to be added together to give you back zero, right? So if this happens n times, that is one plus one plus one plus one plus one, for which we can define this to be n times one, in that situation. So you add one together n times. If you can add one together n times and get zero, we call that the characteristic of the ring because then it has the property that for all elements of the ring R, we have that n times R will likewise equal zero. That, 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 so the characteristic is pretty important. Um, in particular though, if a ring has characteristic n, that means that the ring z mod out nz can be embedded inside of R. And the basic idea is you take you take the one element of uh, z mod n and identify it with the unity of the ring R, and therefore you've embedded z mod n into R. And R doesn't even have to be a commutative ring for that to make sense. Um, so every every ring of characteristic n has a ring that looks like the integers. Um, now, I mean, it could be the integers mod n, right? There could be some reduction modulo n going on there, but every ring has a, every ring with unity has a sub ring that looks like the integers or the integers mod n. Now, in particular, um, when your characteristic is zero, um, that means there is no positive number such that one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one n times will ever add up to be zero. Um, we call that characteristic zero. Now, why do we do that? Well, that's because when you look at the ring z mod zero z, um, you, you mod out zero, which doesn't do anything as a ring that's isomorphic to the integers themselves. Um, and so we call that characteristic zero because a ring of characteristic zero will contain the ring z mod zero, which is just z itself. Um, so rings of characteristic zero will contain an isomorphic copy of the ring of integers z. This is even true of R as a non-commutative ring. It just has to have unity. And so in particular, if you are a ring of characteristic zero, you must be infinite because you have an infinite subset. Uh, so as we try to focus on finite fields, that means we have to look at the situation where we have a positive characteristic. So when we consider finite fields, we're going to consider fields of characteristic P, Now, we, uh, which of course is a positive number. Uh, it's all, we call it P because for a, for a characteristic of a field, uh, actually the characteristic of a domain, if it's not zero, then it has to be a prime number because if your characteristic was composite, like two times three, you could actually produce proper divisors of zero that's not allowed in a domain, that's not allowed in a field. So finite fields always have prime characteristic. Now there is one finite field I should say there's a family of finite fields we already know. Um, so if you take, for example, z mod p, uh, which we often denote as z sub p, right? That's the same notation we used before. Some people like to write it as z mod p z. Some people just write z sub p. Uh, while some people might mean different things in this lecture series, that means the exact same thing. Uh, z p is just the ring of integers mod p. This does give us a finite field. Um, it's going to have order p of course, and we claim up to isomorphism, this is the only field of order P, and thus we call it the field of order P, we call it FP. And by the end of this video, we'll, we'll actually prove why there's only one field uh, up to any finite order, okay? So if you pick different primes, you get different fields of order P. Um, can we get other fields than that? Well, the good news is yes, by Kronecker's theorem, we can build new um, finite fields by using irreducible polynomials over ZP adjoint X. So if I can find a polynomial, say P of X, uh, well, let's not use P since P already has a different meaning here. So let's take the polynomial Q of X, which belongs to um, FP adjoint X right here. And if you're not used to the notation yet, we'll still call it ZP, right? ZP adjoint X, like so. And let's suppose this is an irreducible polynomial. Um, and suppose that the degree of Q is equal to N, something like that. Then if you take 
uh, since this polynomial is irreducible, if we take by Kronecker's theorem the field ZP adjoint X and we mod out by the principal ideal generated by Q, this is going to give us a field. Um, let's call this field um, F sub P to the N, like so, all right? Uh, this is going to give us a polynomial whose degree um, F P to the N right here over F is going to be N. All right, if you take the root of an irreducible polynomial and adjoin it to a field, uh, that will then extend the field by the degree of the polynomial. So we call it the degree of the extension there. So this will be degree N, um, for which then I want you to unravel that for a second uh, and think about how big is that set? Um, so you can get a you can get a field extension of ZP because that's that the base field the base field here is ZP should have written that down there. Um, we're extending the field ZP by uh, n dimension, and I claim that the only possibility you can get there is p to the n. And so this leads us directly into our proposition right here. Suppose that f is a finite field of characteristic p. Then the, the cardinality of this field, which we often refer to as the order of the field, is going to be p to the n, where p is, of course, that same prime number, and n is any natural number, um, where you could include 0 because the 0, uh, the that is, you can just take a field with one element, uh, which would be kind of weird. It would just be 0. We typically don't want to think of that as a field uh, because typically you want to separate it with 0 and 1, but with the exception that 0 and 1 are distinct, it does satisfy all the field axioms. Uh, so typically we are thinking of these as positive integers in that situation, p to the first, p squared, p cubed, etc., etc. So we get a field of order p to the n for every possible order you want. And so like mentioned above, um, if you have a field of characteristic p, then it'll contain an isomorphic copy of z mod p. Okay, um, this is true whether you're an infinite field of characteristic P or a finite field of characteristic P. Uh, therefore, we can view our field F as a VP vector space. That's, that's something we can do. If a field contains a subfield, it will be a vector space over the base field. So F is a v, uh, FP vector space. All right, remember FP and ZP are the same thing. Um, FP is generalizing the notion of ZP. We're going to see that. And we, do, we don't want to call it in general ZN because that does mean the integers mod N, which is not what we're doing. We're talking about the field of order such and such. So if we consider the degree of this thing, so we have a field um, that extends the base field, the prime field, FP there. And so the dimension of that the degree is measuring the dimension of f as a fp vector space, let's call that dimension n. We mentioned earlier by Kronecker's theorem, if we can find irreducible polynomials, we then can construct um, field extensions of degree n if there's an irreducible degree n polynomial. And by a counting argument, there's always a irreducible polynomial over zp of degree n, uh, but that's a topic we can handle some other time here. So in particular, uh, F as a vector space is isomorphic to the set FP to the N, where FP to the N here, this is the set of column vectors um, with N coordinates, but each coordinate has P possibilities. Uh, you have 0, 1, 2, 3, up to P minus 1. So because these sets are isomorphic as vector spaces, I'm not claiming that they're isomorphic as rings because does this thing even have a ring structure? Uh, the typical ring structure you put onto that set is not a field, but they are isomorphic as vector spaces. So there does exist a linear bijection between the two. That bijection says the sets have the same cardinality, which gives us this right here. But as FPN is just the Cartesian product of FPN times, this gives us that the cardinality of that set is the cardinality of FP to the nth power. But FP, it's the set of P elements that gives you p to the n. So every finite field um, will have order p to the n. And by Kronecker's theorem, assuming we have enough irreducible polynomials, we then can produce a finite field of every possible order. So we get a, we get a finite field for every uh, possibility that's allowed to us. There is a finite field for every power of a prime. But why do I keep on saying the, the, the? Why is there only one? We need to make an argument that they, in fact, are one and the same thing. Um, now, in order to do that, I need a little helper proposition first. Um, and this is what's commonly referred to, this proposition is commonly referred to as freshman exponentiation. 
And this is actually a property that's true for commutative rings with unity who have characteristic P. It doesn't necessarily have to be a finite field, but a finite field is included in that. So if R is a commutative ring with unity and the characteristic is P, then it turns out that if you take A plus B to the PN power, this is the same thing as A to the PN plus B to the PN. Um, and this is why it's called freshman exponentiation, because commonly, if you have a college freshman, when they join a class like College Algebra, Math 1050 at uh, Southern Utah University, um, they typically want to distribute exponents across addition. And it makes sense. Multiplication distributes over addition, and exponents is just iterative multiplication. So doesn't it make sense to distribute um, repeated multiplication over addition? Uh, the conflation makes sense, but it's not a valid um, exponential rule, at least not over the real numbers uh, for or the complex numbers, which is pretty much always where a college algebra is doing their algebra. Uh, but over a commutative ring with unity of characteristic P, it turns out you can distribute prime powers where that prime is the characteristic. Uh, and that's how we're going to do this. We're going to do this by induction uh, because if you can distribute a, if you can distribute the pth power, then you can distribute the p to the nth power because you just distribute p, then the second p, then the third p, then the fourth p up until the nth p. So by induction, it suffices to prove that a plus b to the p um, is equal to a to the p plus b to the p. That is it, that the prime, the characteristic can distribute. So you can't distribute every exponent, but if the exponent is the characteristic of your ring, you can distribute it. And this is a consequence of the binomial theorem. For any commutative ring, um, the binomial theorem is valid, and you can use the exact same proof that you use to prove the binomial theorem. It's a combinatorial argument, but it requires uh, commutivity of the ring, uh, dis distribution, and the ring axioms. That's all it is. So the binomial theorem is valid for any commutative ring. Um, and so therefore, this, shell, this shows us that a plus b to the p is equal to the sum where k ranges from 0 to p, in which case we then get the binomial coefficient p choose k, which as a reminder, this is by, by definition equal to p factorial over k factorial times p minus k factorial. One interesting thing about these binomial coefficients is that this is always an integer. This belongs to the set of integers. In particular, it belongs to the natural numbers. Right, um, in which case the natural numbers can be sent into any ring because we can send the integers into any ring, right? Now, there might be reduction mod p going on here, of course, but if you have, since the binomials, the binomial coefficients are integers, we can identify that integer with the integer mod p, um, and so it makes sense to talk about a binomial coefficient in this ring r. Um, so you have the binomial coefficients times a to the k times b to the p minus k, like so. And so this, this, this would hold because of the binomial theorem, which is valid for r. Now look at this number right here, p to the k, as an integer, so not reduced by p yet. Um, this number, p choose k, will be divisible by p. Um, for all of the binomial coefficients, p choose k, as k ranges from 0 to p, with two notable exceptions. Um, it won't be divisible by p when k is equal to zero or when k equals p because in both of those cases the binomial coefficient is equal to one and one will not reduce uh one's not divisible by p and thus it won't reduce to zero when you mod out by p but all the other binomial coefficients will so when you look at this expansion this expansion all of the binomial coefficients are divisible by p and therefore are congruent to zero mod p um, with the only exception being the first one p choose zero for which you're gonna get a to the p power times b to the, uh, excuse me, this is going to be a to the zero power, b to the p minus zero power. And then you'll get the last term, you're gonna get p choose p, uh, which is gonna be a to the p times b to the p minus p. And that of course reduces, since the binomial coefficients are one, and anything raised to the zero power is likewise one. This will simplify, of course, to be b to the p plus a to the p, which is exactly what we claimed it to be, thus proving this very important proposition, freshman exponentiation. So we're, we're gonna use this all the time when we work with fields of characteristic p, in particular for finite fields, uh, this freshman exponentiation applies. So now let's get to the heart of what we wanna prove about finite fields, that they're unique up to their order. 
Um, suppose that f is a finite field and suppose that its order is p to the n. Now this sometimes leads to annoying subscripts and superscripts nested inside of each other, which really doesn't lead to great notation. Oftentimes when people talk about finite fields, since the finite field has always an order p to the n, oftentimes that's abbreviated as just q. So q is a power of P, where the exact exponent n is somewhat irrelevant, so it'll often be suppressed inside this q right here. So f is a field, a finite field of order q, which is a power of p. Um, then we claim that f is a splitting field of the polynomial x to the q minus x. So this is a polynomial viewed over the field fp. So if f is in fact a splitting field, we showed previously when we worked with splitting fields that all splitting fields are unique inside of an algebraic closure. Um, when we apply this to finite fields, in particular, it says that all fields of order q are unique inside of a fixed algebraic closure of, of, of fp here. All right. So since finite fields are always splitting fields, um, they're going to be isomorphic to each other, uh, which as that their order is a is an invariant of isomorphism. This is going to give us that uh, the field of order Q is isomorphic to every field of order Q because every field of order Q is the splitting field to this polynomial. And the proof basically is a generalization of Fermat's little theorem. Remember what that says. Fermat's little theorem tells us that if we have a number A and you raise it to the P minus one power, this is congruent to one mod P where p, of course, is at prime. Now, if you times both sides of this equation by a to the p, this tells us, uh, excuse me, times both sides of the equation by a, you're going to get a to the p equals a mod p. Um, when you look at the first equation, you do have to have the exception that a doesn't equal 0. But in the second case, um, because Fermat's theorem applies this for every non-zero value, it's also true for zero too. Zero to any power is equal to zero. So Fermat's little theorem basically says that if you take an integer and raise it to the pth power, that's congruent to itself mod p. That's basically what we're going to do right here. So we want to argue that in your finite field f, um, if you take any element of f and raise it to the q power, you get back that same element. So let's first start off with zero because it's the only element of the ring that's not a unit. And so it does have to be treated separately for that reason. So if we take uh, zero raised to the Q power, that gives you zero, no big deal. All right, so let's choose any other element of the field. Um, because this element is non-zero, it necessarily is a unit. So U belongs to F star right here. This is the set of units of the ring, um, which, because f is a field, f star necessarily is a finite group. Um, it's finite because f is finite, of course. If you take away an element, it's still finite. Uh, why is it a group? Well, clearly it's associative because multiplication is associative. It has an identity because the ring has unity. It's a field. But every element has a multiplicative inverse because it's a field, you know, except for zero. But if you take away zero, that means we have a finite group, f star. Now, by Lagrange's theorem, um, for finite groups here, if you take an element of a group and raise it to the order of the group, um, that's always going to give you one right here. Now, what's the order of F star? Um, every element of a field has a is a unit, has an inverse, except for zero. So the order of F star is just the order of F take away one element uh, because that's what F star is. It's just F take away zero. So the order of F star is Q minus one. So we get that u to the q minus 1 is equal to 1. And if you if you multiply both sides by u, you end up with uq equals u, just like we did before. In fact, in when we talked about Fermat's little theory in group theory, we actually proved it as a corollary of Lagrange's theorem. We're generalizing that argument to show this property is true for every field. Um, so what we've now argued here is for a finite field, if you take any element of the field and raise it to the q power, you get back that element. That's true whether you have a unit or whether you have zero, although we need different arguments for both of them. All right, so take an arbitrary element alpha that belongs to the field and consider our polynomial x to the q minus x. We then call that polynomial f, and that's the polynomial we care about. This sits over the field zp. Like so. What happens if we evaluate f at alpha? Well, you're going to get alpha to the q minus alpha, but by the previous argument, Fermat's little theorem, you're going to get that alpha to the q is just alpha. Alpha minus alpha is equal to zero. So alpha is a root of the polynomial f. 
And as F was an as alpha was an arbitrary element of F, this shows us that literally every element of F is a root of this polynomial F right here. Okay. Um, now, as f of x has at most q roots because it's degree q, we see that these are all of the roots of f of x. There can't be any other ones because we already accounted for q distinct roots of alpha, and there's at most q. So we so we see that f contains every root of f uh, of little f, and therefore f of x splits over our field f. That doesn't necessarily make it a splitting field, right? Because to be a splitting field, your polynomial is to split, yes, but it has to be the smallest field that, that happens. But of course, um, since the roots of f of x are exactly the elements of the field f, um, I also should point out that if you take the base field fp and adjoin a larger field to it, that just gives you back the field. Uh, but as we discussed with splitting fields, um, if you take the base field and adjoin all of the roots of a polynomial, that constructs the splitting field. And therefore, f is the splitting field for f of x right here. And so, as this holds for any field of order q, um, the previous theorem that we have proven in this lecture series, which we numbered it as uh, 21.2.3, which told us that splitting fields exist and are unique in a fixed algebraic closure. This then finishes the proof and shows us that all finite fields are unique up to isomorphism, uh, not even isomorphism, they're, they're unique up to equality inside of an algebraic closure. Now, if you have different algebraic closures, those different algebraic closures will be isomorphic to each other and the resultant splitting fields in them will be isomorphic to each other. So this then gives us the result we're looking for that all finite fields of the same order are in fact isomorphic to each other. Now we'll talk some more about finite fields in the next lecture of this lecture series, lecture 30, but we're gonna call it close for this lecture 29. Thanks for watching. Um, if you learned anything from these videos, please like the video, subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this in the future, of course. And if you have any questions, please post them in the comments below and I will answer them as soon as I can. Thank you, bye.